Well, we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm Beverly Mills. I'm a trustee of the Sauerland Conservancy. And I'd like to welcome you all tonight to this presentation by one of our most popular speakers, Juanita Hummel, on the topic of wildflowers in a Sauerland Mountain garden. We have just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, our meeting technical host, Karina, uh, who is on with us tonight, she's our bouncer. She <laughs> has all the um, uh, audio muted for all of our participants so that uh, if our dogs bark, it won't disturb everyone else. So, um, uh, and, but you are all free certainly to turn on and off your own video. Um, at the end, uh, there'll be a brief question and answer period. We uh, will all be unmuted. We can uh, have a chance to have a good discussion. So if you'd like to have a question, please type it into the chat, uh, chat feature that you can see down at the bottom, and those will show up on a sidebar. Or even at the end, we can just raise hands and have a discussion. I'll repeat this part when the talk is over. Finally, this talk is being recorded so that we may offer it to others on our website. So please go ahead and recommend it to your friends. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Juanita. Juanita Hummel has lived in this, on the Sauerland Mountain for 35 years. A retired lab scientist, longtime birder, an advocate for land preservation for plants and wildlife, she is the new president of the Washington Crossing Audubon Society. She volunteers as a naturalist at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve and is a Pennsylvania master naturalist. Juanita participates in citizen science projects with WCAS, New Jersey Audubon, and the New Jersey Wildlife Conservation Corps. And she leads bird nature walks for Sauerland Conservancy and a number of other conservation organizations. So we're very lucky to have her tonight. And thank you. Let's get started, Juanita. Well, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, I have way too many slides, so I'm going to get started right away by answering the question to how many wildflowers can you grow in a Sourland Mountain garden? And the answer is hundreds but you'll probably be glad to hear that I don't plan to talk about all of those tonight. I've chosen carefully a few that I think, some of the, the few that are, most of them are native to the Sourlands. They grow here in the Sourlands and they like it here already. Um, and there are a couple of others that aren't, but I'll explain those when I get to them. But first I'd like to play just a little bit of music that inspired the title for this talk. Let's see if this works. Okay, and when we get to the end, I will tell you uh, what I missed or didn't talk about. And that's all the 762 that I won't mention. Not really, I'm just kidding. Gardening in the Sourlands is really a challenge. It's really a big pile of boulders uh, with trees growing wherever they can. Some of them actually appear to be growing out of the rocks and boulders themselves. Uh, this is a picture in my front yard, and pretty much my whole front yard is a hilly boulder field. And there are boulders of different sizes, uh, but in the areas where there aren't boulders, there are little tiny rocks, and maybe these could be used as seeds for the bigger boulders, as Lori suggested earlier. I don't know. So far, none of them have sprouted into bigger boulders. In fact, the the uh, the uh, motion appears to be in the opposite directions with some of the bigger boulders and I've actually seen that cr this crumbling into smaller rocks so so I don't think that's going to be a you're, you're uh, off the hook for marketing those uh, but it's the soil is very acid when we first uh, arrived here we tested the soil pH and it ranges from about five to five and a half 
And uh, that's really terrible for growing a lot of things except moss. You can grow some wonderful mosses. There are lots of different species of moss uh, growing in the Sourlands. But um, I'm not going to talk about those tonight. That will be a talk for another time. And the other thing you run into in the Sourlands, in addition to all the rocks in the soil and the acidity of the soil, is it's an entrained wetlands and there are soggy spots everywhere. And this is a little shot of part of my front lawn, which has a seep in it. And this is, doesn't dry up until about July every year. We've tried various different things, but uh, it likes to be wet. And now we're learning to live with this wet, sunny spot. And it's proving to be actually pretty exciting. But you'll find, uh, I'll show you later, we have some wet, muddy spots. And we have some rocky, muddy spots and soggy spots and uh, lots of wetlands here. So these are, when we first uh, moved here with our um, suburban um, proclivities, uh, we tried a few different things. We, uh, my husband and I both were working at the time. We had small children. So uh, we didn't really have a lot of time to do a lot of work. So we tried the traditional lawn, which seems like a good idea. You plant grass and you just mow it. How easy is that? Well, lawns do not grow well in the Sourlands. They don't grow, they don't like acid soil and uh, there's not much of that soil. The uh, topsoil is only about eight inches deep. So that, that and, it's, and it's just not very good for growing traditional non-native turf grasses. We tried removing the rocks from the soil on the garden beds and there may be something, something to that uh, reproductive characteristic of boulders because they all seem to come back the next year. So it was very, not very good, uh, not a good feeling. You didn't feel like you're accomplishing anything. We also tried landscaping with the old traditional plants that my mother used to grow in her garden. My husband's mother used to grow, and they a lot of those didn't grow very well either. They just it was just not not working. And we also attempted to drain some of the soggy areas, um, and that didn't work either. And now I'm regretting the the uh, the areas that we did drain because now that I've become converted to the the joys of plants that grow in soggy land. I wish I had more of it. So what did work for us was to get rid of the lawn. And I would recommend that for everyone. Lawns serve no useful purposes. Or if you want a green thing that looks like a lawn but isn't, you can replace it with what a friend of mine calls the New Jersey natural lawn, which means you just let whatever wants to grow there grow and you mow it periodically. So it's green and uh, Whoops, it's green, but it is not a lawn. Also, get to know the native plants that will colonize your yard if you let them and figure out how to use them to create appealing landscapes. And I'm hoping tonight I will um, turn you on to some new plants possibly, but also new uses for plants you're already probably already familiar with, you just have, may not have realized um, possibilities. And again, brace your wetlands. There are a lot of plants that grow in the soggy soils. And then, of course, we get to have vernal pools here in the Sourlands, where uh, um, the Sourlands little mascot, the uh, eastern spotted salamander, uh, breeds along with uh, a bunch of frogs and other amphibians. Most important thing you can do before you get started trying to grow things is get rid of the alien invasives. And uh, I've used the word, uh, they're not all alien plants, plants that uh, did not originate here in North America are necessarily bad. It's the invasive ones, the ones that tend to spread out of control that are that you want to get rid of. And of course, the worst are multiflora rose and barberry. And I'm beginning to realize now that we, my husband, I have to give him credit for clearing up most of the multiflora rose and barberry on our property. And now he started on the stilt grass. And now that the stilt grass has been cleared from large areas, it's really amazing to see what's coming up underneath it. So I think this in fact is even worse in some ways, especially for the smaller, more delicate wildflowers than the multiflora rose and barberry, because it produces this suffocating uh, carpet when it dies down in the winter and it just, just smothers everything underneath it. So this is my favorite spring ephemeral. This is the bloodroot. And it's a magnificent flower. When it first comes up in the spring, it just brightens my heart. It's so bright and white and cheerful looking. It's about, it's a big flower too for a, for a spring ephemeral. It's about four inches across. Some of the flowers are quite that big. 
And usually when you see them, they're growing in the woodlands by the ones, or maybe you'll get two or three or small groups. But it is possible to grow these in masses like this. This is part of a, a much larger mass, about 10 by, I'd say, four or five feet, probably about 50 square feet of blood roots that come up in the spring. And the way to do this is to do something that doesn't seem right. If you were to get these, if you didn't have any and you wanted to plant them, you'd probably see that they like to be in pretty full to part shade. And so you'd probably be tempted to plant them in the, sh in the shade. But if you plant them in full sun, this is what they will do. They will flower profusely and spread. But it's not quite that simple, of course, because um, if you leave them in that full sun in the heat and dryness of July, they're not going to do very well. So, and at some of these things, I'll, I'll tell you the little story later, I discovered by accident. But about the time that these flowers don't last very long, they're actually very ephemeral, maybe a couple of weeks at most, and then the flowers disappear. And you, and you will still see, you can see little leaves. I wonder if my cursor works there. There's some little leaves here. This is the little bits of foliage coming up that belong to the flowers. But over here, you can see a different leaf. And that is, these leaves here are the foliage of wild geranium. And this is the next inhabitant of this bed. This is another woodland flower. When you see them growing in the woods, you see very small plants with a few flowers on them. They're very pretty, but if you, you can grow them en masse. Everybody should have these as landscape plants. Uh, again, these are growing in full sun, but now they're acting also as shade for the, um, for the blood roots that are growing underneath them. If you look underneath this foliage, you will see the blood root leaves and the little seed pods on the blood roots starting to, starting to form. Um, so again, these, these um, wild geraniums grow beautifully in full sun in the springtime. Um, this through May, and they have a very long blooming period. These are just wonderful. These are one of my favorites. But they also do not do well. Um, they tend to die back during the summer. And they, they plant may not survive. It gets baked in the July heat. So fortunately, there is this which starts to come up, you start to see the foliage. This is black-eyed Susan. The foliage starts to appear as the, um, as the, uh, the wild geranium foliage is, dying, foliage is dying back. And when, again, when you look under the, this plant, if you look way down, th these, are, this, these plants are about, uh, they can grow maybe three feet high. The wild geraniums are about a foot and a half. So each one is shading out the one, and this is a full sun plant. So this is the one that you're going to have until fall. But underneath, the wild geraniums are setting seeds and dropping them, and the, the blood roots are dropping their little seeds uh, in the soil. And so this whole cycle is repeated next spring, and you don't have to do anything. It just cycles through, and it's been doing this for several, several years. It's really amazing. Um, you do have to keep an eye on the black-eyed Susans because they can get out of hand. So you might want to uh, like remove a few if they start to become too numerous. Or the other thing you can do, and I often do this, is cut the seed heads off the flowers in the fall so they don't uh, reseed themselves too much. Because too much competition eventually will, will uh, uh, have a bad effect on the soil underneath and the other plants may have a tougher time coming up in the spring. But otherwise, so this is, um, yeah, oh, I should mention, if you're going to try this, um, start with the blood roots, plant some blood roots, and if you can find seeds of wild geranium, seed it. Once you've got your blood roots planted, don't disturb them, just leave them alone, don't dig them, don't mulch them, don't do anything, just leave them alone. Um, if you don't, if you can't come by seeds of wild geranium, I'm not sure actually how easy that is, you can just put a couple of plants in there and then just be patient and allow them to grow and seed themselves. And then uh, in my case, black-eyed Susans found their own way there from another patch elsewhere on the lawn, but you could also, and they produce lots of seeds, so you could just overseed that whole thing in the fall with the black-eyed Susans. And hey presto, an automatic garden bed, three seasons. <laughs> This is another plant that you see growing everywhere in the Sourlands, Spring Beauty. Uh, oh, and all those plants, I should say, are good pollinator plants for early spring bees and uh, later on the, 
black eyed Susans for butterflies and, and many different types of pollinators. So they're all earning their keep. So the spring beauties are um, everywhere in the Sourlands. Again, you see them a little, little plant here, a little plant there. Some of them are very pale pink. Some of them are a nice deep pink and they also have reddish foliage. They're really pretty. Most of them have five petals, but this one has seven petals. And I posted this on uh, Sourland Stewards, I think it was last year, a couple of years ago. And I started getting emails, oh, I found one with eight petals. And somebody else says, I found one with nine petals. But I, so if you've got a lot of time on your hands, you can go out and look at your spring beauties and see if you can find one with a lot of extra petals. But I think I have the record here. This one has, I think it's 11 or 12 petals. It looks like two flowers actually fused together in the bud. I'm not sure how that happened, but multi-petaled uh, spring beauties are not unusual. These uh, come up very early and they, they are uh, nectared on by, um, I believe this is the American lady, yes, that's an American lady butterfly. Everybody knows about the big migratory journey that uh, monarch butterflies take, but th this type of butterfly, it's uh, one of the so-called Vanessa butterflies, um, also migrates sometimes from as far as uh, northern Mexico every spring just, and it does it in one generation to get from Mexico to uh, northern United States and even up into Canada. And it's nice for it to have something to drink from when it gets here, like the very early blooming spring beauty. So what we use those. If you look at this uh, butterfly, you can see that its wings are all really raggedy. Um, it's had a hard time. And now it can eat and then lay eggs and it will die pretty soon after it lays its eggs. Um, it's pretty much used up uh, all of its energy. So this is what my lawn looks like uh, along the edges of the woods. It is full of spring beauties uh, mixed in with violet foliage. So this again is an automatic um, uh, landscape feature because these Spring, this is the early the beginnings of the bloom actually, and it gets pinker and pinker as the season goes on. And then as that starts to die back, the violets begin to bloom. Oh, I should mention that uh, spring beauties are also um, food for, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. I think I have a slide about that, but let me just show you. This is mostly the common blue violet, a very pretty flower. And you can grow these, um, you can grow these in, in uh, like actual gardens or in borders or something. If you grow them by themselves, just the violets en masse and keep all the other stuff, all the grasses or anything else that wants to grow in with them, you, they will grow bigger and will produce more flowers than you could possibly believe. And um, this is the yellow violet. We actually have a few species of violets in, uh, in this area, but these are the ones you're gonna find most commonly. This is a downy yellow violet. In contrast to the blue violet, it prefers shade. But it is possible to grow them together if you find just that right, um, right dividing line where on this, on the lower side here, there's a little bit more sun and there's a little bit more shade on this side. And so what you can do, and I've done this in a couple of places, is, is encourage the yellow violets to grow and then encourage blue violets to grow right in front of them. So in deeper into the woods, you have the yellow violets with the blue violets in front, and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and now how do you do that? Well, if you've got violets growing in the woods, they're probably gonna have a lot of leaf litter. So what you do is just gently remove the leaf litter from around the plants. And then that will allow them to drop more of the seeds directly onto the ground, and they're less likely to be hauled away by ants because they are, um, the, the ants actually are responsible for um, redistributing the seeds of lots of violets through a complicated mechanism that I won't um, talk about tonight, but you can find that lots of information about how that works. So just clear the pathway, clear around. You can also tra transplant relatively easily. So if you've got some growing where you don't want them, you can move them and start a patch that way as well. And so why do we, these are common plants that are everywhere. Why do we want to nurture them? It's because they have another role in the ecosystem. And one of their most important roles is to feed native specialist bees. These are little bees that only live for a few weeks and they pretty much only um, feed from one species of plant. And so there's, the, there's one for the spring beauty, the spring beauty minor bee, and the violets also have their own minor bee. 
And if you want to learn more about this, especially spring beauties or, and especially the spring uh, beauty minor bees, um, uh, the amazing Marianne Borge has a lovely essay on her blog, The Natural Web. I'll give you contact information for that later uh, about um, the, the, react, the interaction of these two species. It's really a very, very interesting story. And it's not only spring beauties and violets that have their specialist bees. There are many other plants that we have, native plants here, that also have bees that specialize in that flower. Uh, the body is specialized to get into the flower, to pollinate it, and to get nectar. It's really fascinating. And they're so tiny. This one, as you can see, will fit on the top of your finger. They don't have a sting. They don't sting. They look more like ants, maybe like swarming ants with wings. So, but they're, they're our own native bees, and they do a good job of pollination, even where the honeybees are failing. We've got our own native bees to fall back on, so don't despair. And they also provide nectar for these early migratory butterflies, so the American lady, uh, Vanessa virginiensis, and, and often traveling with it, um, at least on the spring leg of the journey, are red admiral butterflies. This is a fresh one. This one is a second generation. So this one is not the one that came up from Mexico. It's the one that, that was born here. And these are absolutely stunning butterflies. So a good reason to have, and they will also nectar on violets, they, they, a good reason to have a lawn like that. And it's really a stunning sight to see a big flock of butterflies that have just migrated all over your lawn. That's amazing. And uh, the great spangled, whoops, sorry about that. The great spangled fritillary here, I'm showing one with closed wings. They're quite a large butterfly. And this one happens to be nectaring on a purple cone flower. But this uses violets as host plants for its caterpillars. And I've actually watched great spangled fritillaries uh, hovering over that part of the land and ovipositing on the violet leaves. So you will attract beautiful butterflies to your garden. So. They're, they may be common, but put them close to your house and you'll see a lot of interesting things happening. This is another lovely lawn plant for a soggy area, the golden ragwort. Um, and this is a top-down view. Now, I didn't know in the spring when these were blooming that I would be doing this talk in the fall or I would have taken a better picture of how they look from the side because they grow in wet meadows typically, but they will grow in your lawn too which would become a meadow if you just let it keep on growing. And uh, their habit is to put up big flower stalks so that they get up and, 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 and are able to bloom and push their flowers out there for the pollinators before the grass grows up around them. And then you have uh, the basal leaves look like this. They grow in little rosettes. And in fact, I just took this shot uh, a few days ago. So the leaves persist. After the, flowers, um, after the flowers die back and go to seed, um, we usually mow around our patch, which is getting bigger and bigger. We just mow around it to give the leaves a little bit more time to uh, suck up some energy from the sun. And then I mean, as we get really towards the end of the season and the seeding is over and everything is kind of done, you can just mow right over the patch. And these leaves, these little leaves at the bottom will persist. You should never mow lower than three inches, by the way, if you want to do anything like this. You can also mow over the violets if you want. We usually mow around it and doing the same thing, allowing the violet leaves to grow up a little bit and get some energy. Uh, then you can just mow it if you need to do that and it will still come back next spring. Just be aware of what the life cycle is. And these are beautiful. And these are popping up in other areas. And our, this, this is not our patch. I think this might be a cultivar, but I just grabbed this off the internet um, to demonstrate the, how, just how these flower spikes come up out of the basal leaves. Now, this is another beautiful little flower. Uh, the trout lily, it's also known as dog tooth violet, although it's not a violet and um, it's not a lily either, actually. But, um, this is, the, uh, this is a flower for the patient gardener. We started to, well, we had these when we first moved here. We had a few little flowers here and there. Over the years, our colony has spread to, uh, it must be close to an acre. It's all through the woods in some places and out into the lawn. And you just, you, you are going to see a lot of this, this 
foliage. It's named trail lily because of the spotty foliage. It kind of looks like, I think it's a brook trout that people think it looks like. Um, I don't really think it looks much like a fish at all, but then I'm not a fisherman. Um, but the thing with this is you're going to get foliage first and it takes seven to eight years before the flowers actually appear. A plant has to be seven to eight years old. So if you're going to start one of these colonies, uh, it's going to be difficult. If you already have one starting, and you might, you should, if you have a bit of foliage, you should look and see if you can find more foliage. And you can also, now that this is good too to grow in a lot. Let it grow in your lawn if that's where it wants to be, if you've got a shady part of your lawn, because the foliage completely disappears after a relatively short period of time, a few months. This is a, a, not a few weeks, I mean, not even months. And, um, and in its place in, at our house, we usually have moss growing. What I've noticed in is this big area of wood where we have the, the major part of this trout lily colony, uh, has no stilt grass growing in it. So it's somehow preventing stilt grass from growing. So this might be a good stilt grass control in some places. And deer have no interest in it either. I should mention that. So pretty much all of the plants I've mentioned so far, uh, deer have no interest in eating them. At least they haven't shown any interest in eating them yet. Um, so this shows dappled sunlight to medium shade for these, but mesic conditions, so not too wet, not too dry. Um, a, a deep, they need very rich soil with lots of leaf litter, and that's why they're growing in the woods, plenty of that. But it does take an awfully long time. However, these flowers are so pretty, it's so beautiful to see them, that they're worth it, I think. So start now, and eight years from now, you'll have trout lilies. This is another beautiful little woodland plant. It tends to grow in pretty, well, dappled shade to deep shade. This is the rue anemone. And uh, this does grow in groups, but it usually looks like this because there's so many leaves and sometimes other types of vegetation growing. This is another one that you can expand this patch by just removing the leaf litter from around the plants and just allowing the seeds to fall and germinate right under the ones that are already there. And you can get massive, beautiful uh, growths of rue anemone. And this is wonderful to have in your woodland. You have a bare, boring looking spot. Tempt to grow some of this. Uh, it also looks nice, uh, like along, we have a patch growing along the side of our driveway that looks very, which uh, on the shady side of it, and it looks very pretty. This is from Omic Woods, um, and, and this is just a nice little, little inspiration for a way to grow some of these things. Here are your little rue anemones at the bottom here. That's a little patch of those, and they're intermixed with lady fern, a nice color contrast and also height contrast. And back here is skunk cabbage. Who thought that skunk cabbage can be decorative, but in fact, you can. Not that I recommend you plant skunk cabbage everywhere. If you've got a really soggy spot, it's a good plant and it's fun to watch, but, but it can get out of hand. Uh, this is a plant that, oh, and also deer don't seem to be interested in rue anemone either. Uh, this is Jack in the Pulpit. Also, I don't think deer eat this um, for those who have that problem. Um, some of these are even more beautiful than this one. They have deep purple veins here. They're ac absolutely gorgeous. And this is one of those plants that is being hard hit by stilt grass. They really uh, used to have a lot of them and now you just don't see so many anymore, especially in the areas where stilt grass is growing. They just get smothered by it. They can't, they have a hard time pushing their way up because they come up early in the spring and push their way through whatever happens to be in the way. But they do produce these beautiful seeds, which you can readily see. And uh, this is the seed pot. It kind of, looks kind of like red kernel, kernels of corn. And this, these are out there in the woods right now. They're perfectly ripe. And they're, these uh, Jack and the Pulpits are ridiculously easy to grow. All you have to do is collect one of these little seed heads and remove all the little kernels and just spread them around on the ground wherever you want to uh, to grow some new jack in the pulpits. But then the secret is to cover them up with a thin layer of earth, making sure that none of the reds shows through. Because uh, birds are very fond of these if they find them, and mice will also eat them. But if you cover them up so that they, they can't be spotted so easily, um, 
you can grow a lot. Almost the germination rate is pretty, it's pretty amazing. That almost all of them will germinate in, in my past experience. So, and you just leave them out there in the winter, no need to, you know. If I'm not sure if these need to be vernalized, I suspect they do, but um, you know, if you let mother nature do the vernalizing work for you, it's so much easier and leaves you more space in your fridge. This is a weedy kind of thing, flea beans, everybody probably has those, but I always let a few grow, it's very easy, wherever they come up, just leave it for a while. And uh, because it's very popular with some of our tiny native bees, the, the, only a few millimeters long, this one I believe is one of the small uh, carpenter bees, and they really appreciate these small flowers. Another thing you find growing in your yard, this, these are full sun. Another thing that deer don't seem to be interested in is blue-eyed grass. You've probably seen these little blue flowers in the lawn or in your grass or in any area that's out, uh, not too high vegetation in it, oh, full sun. Uh, they're not grasses, of course, they're actually uh, irises, and which are members of the lily family. And if you look at the, the, the um, leaves here you can see that they don't look like grass leaves at all they all each one is separately coming out of the ground instead of being stalked like grass frequently is and this is the flower now this is um a plant that will grow magnificently well if you give it some space so there are two ways of doing this if you're getting rid of your lawn and you find these in your lawn and you like where they are you can just leave them there and clear away the grass about a foot around them they will produce a profuse number of seed pods in the fall. And again, the seeds will fall right down onto the ground under the plant. And next year you'll have several more plants. This will grow, uh, it's capable of growing about a foot and a half high if, if it's growing by itself with no competition from other vegetation. And it makes a lovely edging along a border, for example. And there, this is another one that might or might not be in your lawn. If, if it is, you're lucky. And that usually you see tiny little growths of these little, like four or five little plants. Each one is only maybe half an inch, not even half an inch, I don't think. The flowers are very, very tiny and very low growing. But this is another one. Just give it some room, clear the grass all around from all around it, and the patch will be much larger next year. These are very sweet. You can grow these in. Um, in, uh, it, it does like damp soil. You can grow them on the edges of woodlands too. Again, just make sure they don't get too much competition and don't get overgrown by something taller. They're just adorable. And these are pollinated by a bee fly. Some people have never heard of bee flies. They're not bees. They are in fact flies, but they kind of behave like bees. And uh, in this is a tiger bee fly. This is a specialist. Um, uh, uh, it's a good um, insect to have around to help control carpenter bees. If you have a wooden deck or a barn or something and you hear this buzzing away and see sawdust, you know, and you've got these little round holes, you know you've got carpenter bees that are drilling holes in your wood um, to lay their eggs. And they're very difficult to get rid of without using horrible poisons or being really, really, having really fast reflexes with a fly swatter, which is what I resorted to in desperation, but they're not easy to hit either. And they really like our deck. So these, I was delighted to see this bee fly turn up on the deck because they lay their eggs at the entrance to carpenter bee nests. And when the carpenter bee larvae hatch, hatch out, the larvae of the uh, tiger bee fly will eat the larvae of the carpenter bee. So it's, it's just a nice, method of uh, population control without using chemicals, but you have to encourage the fly. So if you have a problem, you might want to plant some of these little bluets um, near the wooden structure that is uh, problematic and see what happens. <laughs> this is my favorite flower of all time. It is the cardinal flower. Just I'm fatally attracted to red flowers. And this, this is about as red and as beautiful as they get. This is a flower that is designed to be pollinated by hummingbees. A hummingbee, hummingbirds, mm, hummingbirds, I need a drink of water. Because the anthers with the pollen are up here 
and the nectar is down here. And so it's perfectly suited for when the hummingbird sticks its little bill or its long bill down into the nectary and its head will be up here uh, rubbing on the anther and collecting pollen, which it then deposits, deposits uh, on the next flower. This is another flower that has a big rosette of basal leaves and it sends a flower spike. And I've had these grow to be very, very tall. Here's a picture of a hummingbird actually nectaring from, the, from one of these cardinal flowers. And other things will occasionally nectar on them, but as you can see, this is a clouded sulfur butterfly, but as you can see, its head does not reach really, no part of its anatomy reaches the, the anther, so it can't pick up any pollen. It can get, get to the nectar, but it's a long stretch. And so you don't often see too many butterflies. This one is, a, I believe this is a really worn out black swallowtail, also trying. Um, and also you can see the, the anther is up here and the rest of the body, the, the butterfly is way down there, so no pollination. Uh, so this is really a, a hummingbird specialist. We don't have any other birds here that would be able to or want to pollinate this flower. So it's possible to grow these things on en masse. Usually you just see like one or two here and there in the woods. They usually grow in shade. This is another shade and they grow in shade because they like moist soil but you can grow them in full sun in wet soil. This is in our seep area. And this is absolutely amazing when there are hummingbirds around because they probably um, will spend more time getting nectar from these flowers than they will if you have a hummingbird feeder up. And it's just amazing to see them all whizzing around in there. Uh, the trick to growing this on mass like this and keeping them that way is, uh, first of all, the soil has to be very wet. It has to be in pretty much full sun. And the, excuse me, the soil has to be quite wet. And you also have to um, make sure they're protected from deer because deer, they usually don't eat the whole plant, at least not all at once, but they do like the young flower buds. And so you'll have a lot of greenery with no red flowers if the deer get at them. So that's the major, a major drawback with those. The other thing that's very important is that you not mulch them. Um, you have to keep those basal rosette of leaves free from anything. They normally grow uh, along stream banks and in um, dry creek beds, for example, you'll find them where water tends to wash away all the stuff that's around the leaves. Those leaves uh, sometimes will persist in plants through the winter. Uh, and if, the, if it's a new plant or if they haven't persisted, they'll come up very early in the spring and it'll be like a couple of months before the flower spike shows up. But in the meantime, those leaves have to, have to be unencumbered. I found though, that this is one of the best plants. If you can get the plant to grow this thickly, um, is a, an excellent plant for suppressing stilt grass too. It just doesn't, can't find a way to get up through the rosettes or maybe the seeds just don't get enough. Um, uh, if there have been seeds dropped there, they don't get enough uh, sunlight to germinate, but they're very good. You will just have cardinal flowers and nothing else. Keep, as long as the deer don't get to them, that the deer really do like those flowers. This is another related lobelia. This is the great or the blue lobelia, the syphilitica. Uh, this is a much shorter plant. It has a completely, well, not completely. It's got a lobelia type flower, but it has a very different structure from uh, the cardinal flowers. And it's mostly pollinated by butterflies and moths and bees. You'll find the occasional bee, but this is um, a female um, uh, spice bush fallowtail butterfly nectaring on this lobelia here. And these lobelias pop up all over the place. We have a brick patio around the back of the house. It's just brick with no mortar or sand in between the bricks uh, placed on top of um, landscaping fabric. Yeah, and this is in a very soggy area. So this is wet too. Uh, pretty well all the lobelias, the natal lo lobelias that we have like wet, wet soil. They like to be, and they can actually grow in, in very wet soil. Um, and uh, this is a good way, they, they also don't like to have a lot of uh, stuff, mulch, leaf litter, anything around their basal leaves. And when they're growing in between the bricks, um, they're, they're just happy as clams. Uh, we have all sorts of things coming up there and I really hate having to pull them up. We get cardinal flowers growing the same way. The seeds are just 
find their way into the cracks in between the bricks and the plant just spreads its roots out underneath the bricks where it's nice and moist and it's very, very happy. So another way to grow these would be to have like maybe some small paving stones and seed the seeds of the lobelia or the cardinal flower or even both into those um, cracks and grow them that way to avoid you know, having to mess around with cleaning up all around the basil leaves every time, every fall. They look really good together. This, they're um, usually some overlap from the bloom time. That didn't happen this year. I was going to do a little video for a Bowman Sale Wildflower Preserve. Uh, they're asking naturalists to, uh, since people couldn't go there, or many people couldn't for quite a while or couldn't go there as often as they would like to, uh, to do little, to show them what was happening at the preserve through these little videos. And so I thought it might be a good idea to do a lobelia video and to compare the different species of lobelia that we have because they're pollinated by different insects. And, uh, but unfortunately this year, the cardinal flowers just bloomed pretty early and were all done. I don't know whether the heat had something to do with it by the time the, before actually the uh, blue lobelia started blooming. So there went that plan because, uh, but because um, we use, you know, we were supposed to use flowers that were actually growing at the preserve at the time the video was being made. That was the whole point. And uh, you'll also find in here a third species of lobelia. This is called Indian tobacco. It's not a very impressive plant, has tiny little flowers, and it's pollinated by small bees, native bees again, they're doing a lot of work out there on the wildflowers. I think it's called inflata, that's the Latin name, because of these little seed pods, which look kind of like little balloons. And, uh, and the seeds are wind dispersed. So, and quite often when I have patches like this of mixed lobelias, uh, lobelias I will find these little uh, Indian tobacco plants growing in there as well. They're shorter than the blue lobelias, but it's kind of interesting to have all, all three of those all related, but all different. And this is uh, an excellent plant. I've tried to grow milkweed in my yard forever. Uh, I have um, my most successful common milkweed plant is three years old and it's about a foot and a half high. It just, it just won't grow. So, uh, I tried swamp milkweed. This is growing in the seep area, soggy soil. These swamp milkweeds can grow in one or two feet of water. It's really pretty amazing. You usually find them in swamps, I guess, a swamp milkweed is a good name for it. Uh, and it not only uh, serves as a nectar plant for uh, butterflies like the monarch butterfly, but you can also observe the entire life cycle of monarch caterpillars uh, very, just very easily, you just walk out and look at your plant and see what's going on. And so this is an egg. And uh, a short while later, the little tiny, this looks big on here, but it's actually only a couple of millimeters long when it emerges from the eggs. The egg is very tiny. And I'd never noticed, known this before, but the, the caterpillar choose a small hole in the leaf when it first emerges from the egg and goes to the underside of the leaf. And later on, as it gets bigger, it, it's perfectly happy on either the underside or the, the upper side of the leaf because at this stage, it hasn't ingested any of the poisons or enough of the poison, the, the glycosides that are found in the milkweed. And so it's still vulnerable to predators and somehow it knows that when it comes out of the egg and it goes into hiding immediately, which is kind of amazing. And later on, as it gets bigger, of course, and is eaten uh, leaves, and boy, can these caterpillars eat, then, um, then it doesn't have to worry. However, there are predators on this milkweed, and this is fun to watch too. Uh, these, the flowers are used by so many different pollinators that there are certain insects that have found out that they can take advantage of that. This is a, this is a crab spider and it sits in the flowers. You often find it in milkweeds common and the swamp milkweed and trying to look like part of the flower. And when a pollinator lights on the flower, it grabs them usually around the head or neck area and injects um, uh, some venom that is a neurotoxin and it 
paralyzes and eventually kills whatever it is that it caught. And then it sucks the juices out of the inside. And that's what happened to this poor dried up looking moth right here. And there you can see the, that little spider has a nice tubby abdomen. And it, these little things uh, go after um, uh, things much larger than themselves. They have no fear. And also the other thing to watch out for on the uh, milkweed of any kind is uh, mantises. You'll sometimes find mantises, all, I believe all species of mantis have figured out how to eat monarch caterpillars without dying. They remove the intestines or something and then eat the rest of the caterpillar, something like that. I forget the exact mechanism, but they can actually um, eat, mon they're one of the few things that can actually eat monarch caterpillars without any ill effects. And of course, there's a, a lot of romance going on with all those butterflies gathering there in the spring. And here's a female Zabulon skipper just uh, quietly having a quiet drink at the nectar bar. And when she was spotted by a couple of males, and I don't, it's not too clear here, but here's the female and here are two males. They clearly have designs on her. And I watched this for a while. She didn't seem to be interested in either of them. And she was walking all over the flower and they were following her and occasionally having a little tussle with each other. And then she finally just got tired of that and flew away, leaving them alone. This is the female, is, female Zabulon skipper. Well, females and male uh, skipper butterflies do tend to look very different from each other. As you can see, you wouldn't really know um, that they were the same species unless you saw them interacting in this way. And this is uh, the most amazing uh, hummingbird moth. It looks, doesn't really look like either a moth or a hummingbird, but it's about the size of it. But it's really called hummingbird because it has this um, habit of hovering over the flowers. It loves milkweed in particular. It feeds on other things too. But uh, the, as you can see this, uh, this uh, it never lights on the flower itself. So any of those uh, either crab spiders or ambush bugs that might be hiding in the milkweed flowers are not going to get this guy. I have a little uh, video. Let's see if we can get this to work here. Because the best way to see whether these are a member of the clearing moths and you can see how they have transparent um, panels in their wings. And it just hovers and goes to each each little flower in the flower head sticking its proboscis in. Absolutely fascinating. I could watch these all day. They're just amazing. Oops. Here we go. Another thing, a lot of, lot of things, you'll find everything on swamp milkweed. Uh, this is a, uh, a rather worn out uh, spice bush swallowtail butterfly. You get uh, Eastern tiger swallowtail butterflies. This I believe is uh, one of the large carpenter bees that um, whose larvae the uh, tiger bee fly preys upon. Uh, the main insect problem with milkweeds is the oleander aphids. Oleanders are not native to North America and neither are the aphids, but they are found here. And the way to control these is with um, insecticidal soap, which clogs up their spiracles. You just have to be careful um, to make sure there are no monarch caterpillars on the plant before you do that, because you could kill the, the caterpillars too, but only if you apply the soap directly to them and, and cl clog up the little um, holes that they use to breathe. Um, otherwise, the residue is completely harmless to them. And I usually treat these only during the active growing season because when the plant starts to die down, I, I stop uh, trying to um, treat them if they're still present, which they often are. Because if you don't treat them, then during fall migration, you may get visits from these little guys. These are ruby, ruby crowned kinglets and they love aphids and they keep revisiting these milkweed plants over and over uh, eating the aphids. I have another plant I'll show you later um, that is actually a non-native but that tends to develop some sort of a black aphid in October, this is, which is the month that these guys usually come through on migration uh, south. And uh, they 
somehow know that and they will forage around those plants too. So, so you're, you can use those aphids to feed kinglets during migration. It's called ruby crown kinglet for those people who are not familiar with it because in the spring, the males stick up this little crest of red feathers um, in a territorial display and also to attract lady um, ruby crown kinglets who don't have ruby crowns, they just have them. So these ones here could be either males or females. It's impossible to tell because the male keeps his little red crest usually pretty tucked away during the fall and winter. This I just threw, this is a sunflower. It's not a sunflower. This is a sunflower like flower that turned up in the yard spontaneously. And I love this one. It's called false sunflower and it's, whoops, it's called false sunflower because um, true sunflowers have ray and disc flowers, but the ray flowers, these petal-like things are sterile. They, they have some flower parts, but not enough to produce a seed. Whereas the, the false sunflower has uh, fertile ray flowers and fertile disc flowers. And it's easy to identify, which is good when there are a lot of flowers that look like this. So all you have to do is pull out one of those little ray flowers. And you can see it has tiny pistil, all ready to accept pollen. And the ovaries are down here. And uh, it, this can also form seeds in addition to the disc flower. So an easy to identify flower that looks like so many other flowers is good with me. It also, uh, it's uh, susceptible to deer. The deer, again, like to eat the flower buds off this plant. They tend not to eat the rest of the plant, but they will nip the flower buds off as they, as they form. So it uh, unfortunately needs protection, but it's, it's a gloriously beautiful plant. Um, this is an amazing um, pollinator attractant. The, uh, there are several species of, of hyssops, uh, agastache, that uh, you can grow. They're really more, they're native to North America, but they're really, uh, the, the one that I have shown you here, which is the, um, is the uh, anise-leaved, um, well, that's not, anise-leaved uh, hyssop is, um, I believe, more of a, a like a Midwestern species, but it grows very well here and it attracts everything like this the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. The flowers kind of open, you can see some of them are open and some of them have already gone, gone to seed, so they open kind of randomly. The bloom period is very long and you will have sometimes um, uh, pollinators and seed eaters uh, arriving at the same time. And here we have two birds that really appreciate the seeds of the anise hyssop. One is a goldfinch and you can see quite a lot of flowers on here but it's not eating the flowers it's eating those the the flowers that have already produced seeds and this is in winter there's still some left the goldfinches didn't eat them all and this is behind siskin we're now right now I don't know if people have noticed these birds yet or well some people have noticed them out their feeders this is uh, we're having an eruption this year because um, there has been a seed crop failure in Canada and these birds are hungry so they're coming down farther south this happens every few years the last time was um, um, just before Hurricane Sandy. I remember it because my deck was covered in these birds and when the storm hit, they all went underneath the deck for shelter. It was really wild. And then uh, two days later, they left. I think they thought they, they didn't like the weather in that, this neighborhood, that was for sure. So they're sweet little birds and they can just perch so nicely on these seed heads and uh, help themselves to the seeds. Now this is a plant that one of the uh, non, uh, or if you want, want to call any non-native plant um, desirable, this one is pretty good. This is uh, actually a, a stone crop and uh, a lot of people, I don't know if people do it, it was very popular back in the day. I don't know if uh, a lot of people are still growing it, but it's a really good pollinator plant. Um, and it's not obnoxious, it doesn't spread. It's easy to grow, but it doesn't spread, spread itself very widely. Um, so you can keep it under control. And it looks wonderful. Here it's interspersed with some lady ferns and we've got some white asters to start to bloom. This is a fall blooming plant. Most times deer leave it alone. I've only had it eaten twice 
again, they went for the buds when they were green. They kind of look like a broccoli when they, before they, the flowers open up. And maybe that's what the deer thought they were eating. I don't know, but only twice in 35 years, or well, maybe I've had this, this plant for maybe 30 years, have they eaten the buds. Usually they don't touch them. And I like this plant especially um, because butterflies such as this red spotted purple butterfly will take an, an inordinate amount of time sticking their proboscis in each one of these little tiny flowers. And as a result, the butterflies are on the flower for a long time and it makes it really easy to take pictures of them. So that's how I got this shot of this butterfly. And the other thing that is interesting, this is, a, this is one of our native bumblebees and it is asleep. You can see it doesn't move when you go up to it or when I went up to it when I was taking this picture and you can see its wings aren't moving. That's very unusual in a, in a bumblebee. It's, it's asleep and I didn't know until I researched this that these bees that don't live in hives or live in trees or anything, that ones that lay their eggs in holes in the ground, sleep on flowers and, and leaves. And, uh, but this is the only plant I've seen in my yard that actually seemed that, that where I've ever seen a bee sleeping. And they, you will see this often. I don't know why, but they do like to sleep on these plants. And that, of course, provides a great photo opportunity if you're photographing bees. So fall, we're getting, what are we doing? Oh, good. Fall is all about asters. These are the best pollinator magnets. You must plant asters, no matter what you do. And a lot of them will come up spontaneously. Uh, no matter where you live. Um, and often I used to do this. They look kind of weedy when they're first coming up and I used to pull a lot of them up until I decided to do this great experiment and just let everything grow. And that's how I discovered how important these plants are to various species of pollinators. So here's a monarch that's, that's, um, that's uh, nectaring on, I think, think this is a Canada goldenrod. Um, and goldenrods, of course, are members of the aster family. And this is uh, an American lady butterfly, um, which is another Vanessa butterfly, which is nectaring on the asters. But these are my favorite asters. These are asters that uh, Mother Nature designed to live in woodlands. And they're not exactly living in a woodland here. When you see them in the woodlands, they tend to be kind of, um, kind of scrawny looking. Um, these yellow flowers are my favorite goldenrod, which is the wreath goldenrod, also known as a blue stemmed goldenrod. They're very beautiful. The flowers grow in the leaf axles all along the stem and they're just a beautiful shade of yellow. They're called wreath because you could take these stems with, uh, with all the yellow flowers on them and make wreaths out of them. I, if you wanted to do that, I don't, I just let them grow. Um, this is, um, again, these flowers get quite a lot of sun, but they don't get the sun during the hours when you're not supposed to be outside in the sun without sunscreen on, say between 10 and 2, because of this big tulip tree that's growing here, and it shades this perfectly during those, those hours of 10 to 4. And so it gets sun in the morning and sun in the afternoon, but it doesn't get the intense sun. And so it feels kind of like it's growing in a woodland. And they just make such a glorious looking mass of flowers. They look really weedy when they're coming up, but when they burst into full bloom and fall, they're just spectacular. And they are humming with pollinators. You can stand on our deck. Our deck is back, back over here somewhere. Um, and if you stand there and it's quiet, you can just hear this hum. And it's all the bees that are working these flowers. So here's a close up look at a, a young version of the, the, um, the wreath goldenrod. And this is the flowers of the blue wood aster. They're the yellow uh, centers are the ones that are saying, come and drink from me because I'm not pollinated yet. And as soon as they're pollinated, they turn purple. And really, if you watch a bee um, or a butterfly working this plant, it does not go to the ones that are purple. It just knows. It goes to only the ones that are yellow. Not going to waste any time. Because they've got so many of these little flowers to, <laughs> to explore. And again, they just create a beautiful spectacle in the fall. So here's some of that uh, Cedum Autumn Joy. There's some white asters over here. 
somewhere in here there's some white snake root here's some more of the the wreath goldenrod and just having all this growing en masse makes up for all the weediness you had to put up with earlier in the summer as they were coming up it's just spectacular and so helpful to native pollinators this is a different type of aster. But, well, by the way, um, a number of um, skipper butterflies use asters as, um, as host plants too. Uh, the white wood aster, this is a tiny uh, plant. It's not very tall, maybe grows to be about a foot high, so it's much shorter than the other asters. And again, in the woods, you tend to see these in little, a few here and a few there. But the same way, if you remove the leaf litter and let the seeds fall to the ground, you can gradually expand this patch to be as big as you want. And they look spectacular. They grow in quite deep shade sometimes. And this bright white spot in a shady woods is really, really a very nice look. These ones too have yellow when they're not pollinated and purple than they aren't. A lot of asters do that actually. And there are a lot of other species of aster that will come up. So you just have to let them all grow and see which ones you like. We've got heath aster, we've got um, calico aster and panicle aster um, in addition to the other ones that I mentioned. And, um, and they're all, all great for pollinators. Make a space in your yard for them. So asters are one of the plants that have been, um, uh, have been used to make cultivars, which is of course a cultivated variety of native plants. And they're usually designed to appeal to only one species and that species is Homo sapiens or men. And so, or men, not men. I don't wanna be sexist or anything there. Um, so you get bigger flowers, or they want to develop different colored flowers, they want to make them resistant to insects. Um, and along the way, though, you have to, if you want to use cultivars, some cultivars are quite beautiful. They take your small aster, for example, and make it twice as big. A lot of the asters you see in commercial nurseries in the fall are cultivated asters. Uh, you won't often see very many pollinators on some of them, though. And that may be because uh, they've lost their fragrance. That's actually one of the first things to go when, when you uh, make a cultivar. Um, just look at some roses that are still beautiful roses, but have absolutely no rose fragrance left. And this fragrance, we may not necessarily find, uh, be, even be able to notice it because fragrance is really just chemicals that are emitted by the plant that guides specific insects to the flower. And some, as we talked about earlier, uh, some pollinators are very uh, closely wed to a particular flower or flower type. So that, that's, that could uh, mess things up. Um, also, if you're messing around with the colors, there are colors there that we can't see, but the birds can, particularly in the ultraviolet range, and so that some insects can as well. And you might uh, unknowingly be breeding out the exact thing that would attract the bird. Uh, or the insect to that plant where it could find food. Uh, and of course, if you're breeding it for resistance to insects, uh, the plant may no longer be palatable uh, or be able to be used by pro provide nutrition for some of the caterpillars. So my um, philosophy about that is that mothers knows best, mother being mother nature. And, uh, and if you can, I mean, there's nothing wrong uh, to with using cultivars, although um, uh, a lot of naturalists are beginning to move away from considering, you know, from saying that that's a good thing to do. Is it better than using a non-native plant? Maybe, but if it's not doing any good, if it's not um, serving its role in the whole ecosystem, then you know it's really kind of hard to justify using it. Some cultivars do, for example, produce more nectar, which may or may not be a good thing. But again, you don't know what you've lost when you've started messing around with the genetics of that plant. Okay, we're getting almost to the end. Oh, I'm almost on time. That's good. Uh, this is an interesting little plant that you may not even have heard of. It's the violet wood sorrel. It's related to the common yellow wood sorrel that we see a lot of that grows um, all over the place. But in some ways, it's very different, even though it is also an oxalis. Uh, this one is pollinated by little bees. 
Um, it blooms, uh, it has these violet, beautiful violet flowers that only open when the sun is out. Um, so on cloudy days, it tends to close up to probably to save the nectar. And you can see these adorable little leaves that look like shamrocks or, or like the regular common yellow wood sorrel, but unlike those species there, each one of these leaves is one plant. So just one leaf, one plant, and uh, one flower spike if the plant is going to bloom. Not all of them do bloom. This is another one of these plants that has to reach a certain level of maturity um, in order to produce a flower. But they can grow, um, they can, I've seen, we do have these, uh, I've seen these in a couple of places. One is um, Omic Woods has a place where these grow. They're growing on a slope where it's, it's moist soil but not wet and uh, not dry either. Um, in, uh, they seem to like to grow near rocks. There are also a some at um, Rocky Brook. I think it's Rocky Brook. Rocky Brook. One other place. They're not common at all. I don't know if they're considered rare. I forgot to look them up, but they're very uncommon. Um, in fact, Hannah Southers, I'm sure a lot of you know Hannah Southers. Um, she knows plants. She's a, a bird guru, but also um, very knowledgeable about plants and she has never seen one and I wanted to take her to where I know there are some this spring when they were blooming and unfortunately that was during the big lockdown so hopefully she's 89. We're pretty sure she's going to make it to 90 so um, and so I hope to be able to take her to see this next year. But if you want a bit of a challenge, these do not transplant well. I don't know if you can get seeds for them, but they would make a lovely little ground cover, very charming, low growing, about an inch high um, in, a, in a bare spot in a dryish area of the woods. And they definitely be worth trying. I have not succeeded very well with these yet, but I'm going to keep trying because they are so charming. And this one I put in at the last minute, actually, I wasn't going to mention this one, but um, I happened to be out with um, uh, Tina Notas of DNR Greenways yesterday. She came birding with us yesterday morning. I think it was yesterday it was, yeah, yesterday was Wednesday. And, um, and there are a few small plants there of the winged monkey flower, which is a flower that's considered rare and are threatened or endangered in several states, including New Jersey very rare in New Jersey and also in southern Canada. Uh, it's a host plant for the buckeye butterfly and people have noticed a decline in buckeye butterfly populations as well. There may be a connection there, although I think the buckeye can, can use other plants, but this is, I believe, the preferred one for this species. And I think personally, from my personal experience, that that stilt grass may be the reason why these plants are becoming so rare, especially in our area. And I say that because this is a, a soggy part of my backyard. This is very muddy and wet. This is what they like, muddy and wet, rich mud that never dries out. And my husband, uh, having uh, gotten tired of cutting down uh, um, Barbary and multiflora rose, started working on stilt grass a couple of years ago. And he was clearing this out, this part out here. And he noticed these little blue flowers underneath the stilt grass. So he called me out. And, uh, you know, I sort of leapt into the air. It's like, oh, it's winged monkey flower. I was so excited, you know. You know, he likes finding things for me that I get excited about. So and that don't cost him anything. So <laughs> and so he cleared out and we discovered we have this huge patch. I've never seen one this big in the wild of monkey flower. All of this is monkey flower. And we have some more downstream in this little rivulet here as well. Um, and this is what they looked like when they came out from under the stilt grass. They didn't look too happy. The flowers don't look too good and the leaves are all eaten up by insects. And I'm not sure all of them were, were eaten up by the right insects, but they perked right up once we got the stilt grass off them. And here is, um, so um, this, is, this is what the flowers are supposed to look like if they haven't been, up, been uh, covered up by stilt grass. So uh, Tina was interested in, um, she was just sort of musing about um, whether it would be a good idea for DNR to uh, get some seeds from monkey flower plants and, uh, and uh, propagate them in the nursery and see if they could either you know, sell them at the plant sale um, or if they could um, 
maybe you can also use the, some of those plants to repopulate the areas that you can get the stilt grass cleared out of the areas where they used to be and there are a couple of places where they used to be at um, at uh, St. Michael's in uh, on the, the, Saint, the uh, Aunt Molly Woods section of the, the St. Michael's Preserve and one of those populations appears to be completely gone now and a couple almost got weed whacked last summer but uh, so they're they're struggling very much so I kind of did a little bit of it. This would be a good thing to try if you want to try an experiment. Apparently the seeds do um, grow, uh, germinate pretty readily. So they're not difficult to germinate anyway. Um, they do need that wet soil that never dries out. Some of the, the uh, conditions are I've listed up there. And so I looked around and I found that Toadshade Wild Farm, which is a great source for uh, relatively locally uh, based uh, wildflower seeds and plants, uh, they're based in Frenchtown, does have these available and they occasionally have plants available as well. Uh, the one thing I didn't get to find out is whether where they source their monkey flowers from. So I'm going to try, oh, when I went out to, so after I spoke to Tina yesterday, I went and looked at our monkey flowers to see they have seeds now. And I discovered that the deer had not touched the plants. They didn't touch them all summer, but they did eat the, the, uh, the spikes that had the seeds on them. So they ate a lot of the seeds off the monkey flowers. So I we're going to fence that all in for next year. Um, but I did find some seed pods and each pod has about a hundred tiny seeds. So I'm going to take those seeds, those hundred tiny seeds, and I'm going to um, sow them outdoors. So I'm going to let mother nature vernalize them because I suspect they do need to be get have that cold period, maybe even a freeze thaw, and see if I can get uh, some growing next year. And if I do get those plants to grow, I'm going to donate them to DNR. Maybe some, if, uh, if uh, the Sour Line Conservancy would like them to, I'd be happy to see what I could do there. But, so get rid of that stilt grass. All right, so this is a book I would highly recommend if you haven't already read it. This um, is a fantastic inspiration for starting a, or nurturing the ecosystem in your own backyard, uh, whatever the size it is. Um, he now um, also has a little discussion about cultivars in there, which uh, expressed some concerns that were similar to the ones that I just expressed before, but he has some great tips on how to uh, get started and how to continue making your own backyard into a into a little um, botanical garden or a, an eco preserve and he's also a new jersey native too so what could be better um other sources of info about plants and other things that grow in the sour lands um uh, Mary Ann Borges blog, The Natural Web, where you can find information on the uh, spring beauties and the specialist bees. She has a lovely um, essay on her blog about the uh, spring beauties and the bee relationship and lots of other things too. So I would highly recommend that you go and check it out. And also uh, I post a lot of the things that I find in my yard on the Sourland Stewards, uh, preferentially actually, the, if they're found in the Sourland. So uh, that's, and so do other people. I'm not the only contributor. So that's a good place to just go and see what people are finding locally and see if you're interested in looking for it yourself. So what did I miss? So the end of the song says, uh, what I missed, whoops, not quite. What I missed, you'll surely pardon. So. There are lots of other things that you can use in your landscape that are native. Trees, shrubs and small understory trees, mosses and lichens especially. There are so many different types of mosses uh, that would in itself take up a whole hour. Vines, grasses, sedges, reeds and rushes, so many of them. We let a bunch grow and we have at least a dozen species of sedge. Uh, at least four or five different reeds. That, this is just what I was able to identify and, and a couple of species of rushes. Um, and some of these have beautiful growth habits. And if you were to just isolate them or grow them in a, in a bed or just give them their own space, um, especially something as a sedge called, um, it's uh, Carex pennsylvanica, which grows into a kind of a low fountain shape. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, but when it's being 
competed with by other grasses and, and other things, you don't really recognize it until you give it its own space and allow it to do its own thing. And, uh, but that again, is that maybe that's a talk for another day. So a final reminder to look for little ash trees. As you know, we're losing ash trees and, and uh, the Sourland Conservancy is taking, uh, taking a leadership role in trying to, to replant the canopy basically and get the trees to grow up. But there are, before the ash trees died, a lot of them, and this happens apparently with a, a number of species, knew that they were dying basically. I guess they felt that they were dying. They had a huge, um, produced a huge number of seeds. Several years ago this happened and these seeds are still germinating. And we have found several little ash trees in our yard. If you get them when they're really small, you can transplant them. So look for those, Le learn to recognize the difference between say an ash tree and a hickory. They sometimes look similar because they have terminal twigs and I mean a terminal leaf, uh, but a different number of them in some cases. We have white ash and green ash. And uh, if possible, if you can replace a dead ash with a live ash, that's good because uh, the state of New Jersey in, in conjunction with a bunch of other states have developed biological controls for the emerald ash borer that attacks it at different stages of its development. I believe they have three. And a while ago, um, uh, Washington Cross and we had the New Jersey State Entomologist come and give us a talk on, uh, on biological controls. They're doing a really good job. And he was very um, optimistic that while we were going to lose our big ash trees, we were not going to lose the species like we did with chestnuts and uh, elms and things like that. Uh, so these little ash trees actually do have a shot. And uh, it's worth finding, if you find them growing someplace that you don't want, we have one growing out from under our deck, for example, uh, which can't stay there or we're going to lose the entire deck and maybe part of the house if it grows up. Um, and then just consider transplanting them to if you see a, an open spot in the woods. Okay, that's about all I have to say for now. And I will be glad to take some questions if you have any. Okay.